Nice, thank you. I'm Nick Reinhardt, and this is my studio assistant, Dot, and this is Show Us Your Junk. I've always felt like kind of weird about calling this a studio because it's just a room with a bunch of junk in it. Uh, but I've never had a room to store all my junk. This is the first time. So I guess it kind of technically is a studio as I've like, you know, recorded stuff in here. But there's a ton of junk, as you can see. There's guitars, pedals, doodads, you know, things all over the place that I've acquired over like the last uh, 20 years ish, you know, like collector style. I just, I got stuff. I like stuff. I like Craigslist in and you know, like it's a, like an addiction sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, so I got a bunch of things, uh, guitars, you know, this is a, a one, two, three, four, five guitar stand, but I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, usually nine guitars in there, uh, guitars all over the place. I used to have all these in like cases in a storage unit or something, but I'm like, well, I got the room now. It's kind of sick to have them all out. So yeah, I got lots of weird guitars. I'm a big supersonic guy. I think, of, how many of these do I have? Let's see. Let's see if I can hold all my supersonics. Uh, supersonic is a guitar that was made uh, by, by Squire, uh, Fender Squire, in the uh, the late 90s, mid to late 90s. How many do I have here? One, two, three. Yeah, this is all my Supersonics. Uh, this was the reissue that they made that I helped them with uh, when they, um, you know, came out with this again a couple years ago. But anyways, I'm getting sidetracked talking about Supersonics. Um, I saw this blue one, this blue sparkle at a U shop in Sacramento. I walked by it, I was like, I don't know, grabbing pedals or something one day. This was maybe 10 years ago, and I came across this guitar, and I was like really annoyed about it because I'm like, what? It's like a backwards thing. It's so weird, it doesn't make any sense. You know, this looks right, but it was like this, you know, and it was just blue sparkle, and it just really, really annoyed me. I didn't, I didn't know what to make of this guitar, and I walked by it, and I was like, I was playing, this was my main guitar at the time. This is my second guitar ever, uh, a Mexican Telecaster. So this is my main guitar, so you could imagine like, if I'm on a telly vibe and I see this, I'm like, dude, who the hell thought this was a good idea? And then, like I got home and I was telling my friend about this guitar that I saw and I had taken a photo of it and was like, look at this stupid thing, it's like, bright sparkle blue, it's backwards, it's a squire, like, it's so weird that that would even exist. And then what I realized after, you know, like three days of complaining about this guitar was that I was in love with this guitar. So I went back, checked it out, I think I put like a down payment on it or something, and eventually ended up with this guitar, my very first Supersonic, and then obviously became like a big love affair with this thing. It's just cool, uh, it was modeled after, I guess a uh, photo of Hendrix playing like an upside down jag. So, you know, if you could imagine Jimi Hendrix playing a right handed jag that was flipped upside down, I guess. So that's the supersonic uh, thing. A lot of the gear acquisition started with, you know, newspaper ads, eBay, Craigslist, pawn shops. There, specifically, I remember one time in 2005 being on tour somewhere, I wanna say like West Texas or something, and we would do the thing where it's like, oh, you just stop at pawn shops in random towns and you go check for something. There could be something cool. Like one of my earliest memories is the three of us, you know, we were a four-piece band, Terramelos, and me, 
the bass player and the other guitar player, it'd be this stupid thing where the van would get parked and then everyone would just run out of the van and into the pawn shop and scurry in. And it was this bullshit thing of like, who would find the pedals first? You gotta get in there first because you're gonna get that. And I remember being like, this is so lame that we're playing this game. Like, I hate doing this because I'm in the backseat and oh, you were up, you know, in shotgun and you got out first. And it, it happened one day where we ended up at this shop, I think somewhere in Texas, and the guitar player got out first, he made it to the counter first, and he found um, three Ibanez pedals of the, I can't think of the name of that series right now, we're gonna edit in a shot right here of those uh, pedals. Um, but anyways, he got two modulation delays and a compressor, and it, he got them for like, you know, these three pedals for like $110 or something, and maybe even less, maybe 80 for all three. You know, he bargained with the guy. And I remember being so mad, like, damn, dude, you got those. And it was this like awkward thing where he didn't offer to give me one of them. And I, it was this like just drama that like built up for literally a year later or something, maybe even years. But anyways, he did end up giving me one of the modulation delays many years later when I was like, dude, can I get one of those? Like, I remember what happened and he was cool, he gave me one. But anyways, that was like the collector's mentality, like Genesis story, I feel like. Just looking for stuff and, you know, finding deals, you know, like it's it's like an addiction, right? Where you're just like, Craigslist is on my daily routine of like just surfing on my phone or my, you know, my computer or something, just looking for cool things. So. That's really what it is, you know, just like finding stuff where you're like, oh, that seems interesting. And there's a ton of stuff in that back room that I absolutely don't need, but it still brings me joy to have that stuff and just have access to it and have a life where it's like, oh yeah, this afternoon, I wanna plug some things in and just like make something that's cool sounding. And even if I don't record it or make a video of it, even if I'm just like, oh yeah, I'm just jamming at home, having fun, like that is like really cool to me to be able to do that. Uh, this is kind of cool. I think I've talked about this before, but this is Jamie Stillman of Earthquaker Devices fame. This is his old jazz master. Big fan, mastery, you know, kind of cool. Um, I got, this is like a funny little pair. Anyone, can anyone identify like what's going on here? You got the curtain, Courtney. Got this when I was, uh, I think 14 years old. Insert photo of me holding my Jag as a 14 year old. Here's another Jag. Um, this is a very highly customized Jaguar, kind of funny DiMarzio rail pickup, uh, totally kind of jacked up. You notice I have two inputs on this thing. That's because I installed this contact mic, which when you plug into the second input, it, you know, you're getting the sound off this mic, which picks up all the auxiliary sounds, you know, clicky, metally, stringy sounds, you know, that are coming off like acoustically off the guitar. So it's kind of a fun, different sound. And yeah, people like, you know, roast me for the unclipped strings, which to be fair, I have not, I've like been not clipping my strings for about 15 years, but I finally had a good reason to not clip my strings was, well, when you have a contact mic on the guitar and you do this sort of thing, it picks up, you know, the funny metallic, not good sounding <laughs> uh, things. So yeah, so it's kind of a cool guitar. So here's our contact mic. Uh, I had a guy install this, like I was saying, I removed the tone knob uh, on the guitar and just had that turned into an output. And what I was doing before, you know, there's a cable, a little teeny guy that comes off the contact mic and then usually it's uh, like a big fat quarter inch, uh, you know, slot or whatever. And before I had it just, you know, like screwed or like, taped or hammered onto the back of the guitar or whatever. Uh, so anyways, this is a much nicer version of it. So this is what it does, you know. 
you know, it's tapping on a microphone. You know, there's so much like pieces and metal to a Jag that, um, you know, there's different sounds. So I just really like the percussive element of it. Or just like even the jankiness of, you know, the mic picking up the acousticness of the strings coming off the guitar. I'm also very into guitars that sound like synthesizers as I love synth and piano and anything that involves sitting down at something with keys, but I'm not very good at playing them. I never learned how to play piano or like figure that out. So I got into this world of like, you know, using a guitar as a controller for keyboard synthy sound. This is actual junk. This is like a proper piece of junk right here. There's a U-Rock guitar that um, I'll plug in and make some sounds for you and does kind of some cool synthy things. Back to the supersonic. You can see that this is a, I guess, I can't, anytime I call this a MIDI pickup, someone in the comments is like, it's not MIDI, it's blah, blah, blah. But for all intents and purposes, it's converting the signal into you know, a MIDI type sound. So anyways, it's a big fat gnarly cable that uh, plugs into it and you know, you can control synthesizers through your guitar as opposed to say, you know, a keyboard like this where I just don't, I don't really know how to make cool chords or like, I just, I don't really know what I'm doing on a keyboard. So to, to be able to have the option of, you know, making those sounds via guitar is pretty cool. Uh, obviously, this thing's weird. There's like a whole insane story to this guitar that I feel like I would, it would take me like literal hours to go through this, but this guitar used to belong to a dude named Steve Carnelli, who was the in-house composer for Hanna-Barbera in like the 80s. So I somehow ended up with this guitar and the brain to it and all of his memory cards and patch notes for making, you know, Hanna-Barbera sounds. So it's insane, and I know that's kind of like, you know, a tease, but like, just catch me next time. Just come over, if you wanna come over and hang out in the studio at some point, we'll set it all up and I'll show it to you. But it's crazy. So I'm into synth guitars, that's the synth world. traditional or out music, whatever you want to call it, you know, the way my timeline works is like Metallica and Nirvana at nine, 10 years old. And then, okay, like loud kind of aggressive music, then that sort of leads you to punk music. So 14, 15, 16 is like, yeah, Sex Pistols, like, you know, like rock, hard rock, Green Day, you know, no effects, like that kind of thing. And then I think it's around the time, let's say, uh, junior or senior year where it's like Fugazi, electronic music, and then like a devotion to stuff that's out that kind of opened my eyes to like, oh, whoa, I have all this like foundational building blocks of like a rock guitar player, but now I'm kind of starting to realize like, oh, there's all these kind of people doing more interesting things. Going back, Nirvana and Sonic Youth, like those are bands that I was into when I was 10 and 11 years old, but I guess it didn't click in a creative way of what they were doing. I specifically remember the punk band that I was in before, Terra Mellos, there was like a song. That, I think the last song we had written was me with this kind of like twiddly guitar riff that I would say I guess was like sort of techy and proggy. I mean, and maybe I was like ripping off Hella or Fugazi or something, but it was just this kind of twiddly guitar riff that was a bit 
unusual for the, a punk band setting. And I can remember the singer being like, what would I even like sing over this? And you know, the other guitar player and drummer being like, huh, what are we supposed to do with that? And that was when I was like, I need to like start a new band and like actively remove myself from like being in a punk band to just getting bored with it and being like, well, I wanna play, I wanna move my fingers faster and like, and I don't wanna just be playing power chords, I wanna do like different cool sounding things. And I kinda have to do that in the context of something other than a fast, thrashy punk band. This is my fun shelf of inspiring books and doodads and things that I've collected over time or found on the side of the road or whatever. Uh, so exhibit A, Sonic Youth set list from 2006 in Sacramento. I'm a big Sonic Youth fan. I don't know, I was gonna say if you haven't figured that out and I don't know if by watching this you would know that, but like sonically, aesthetically, they were a big deal for me. I saw Sonic Youth in 1995 at Lollapalooza and it was a pretty big deal. This is a security slip that came out of Thurston's guitar case when I got to interview him for Fender uh, a couple years ago. Uh, like he opened his case up and you know, he looked at it and tossed it and I was like, fuck, I gotta grab that. Uh, but yeah, so that's my little Sonic Youth Zone. Over there I have a uh, test print for the Jet Set record, which is pretty sick uh, for the cover. That was awesome. Uh, there's a lot of Aphex stuff around here. Aphex Twin, big fan. This is like the source for like a lot of my, I guess, electronic synthesizer-y stuff. Um, electronic music was a big deal for me as like a teenager. Basically I got into like, technical proggy music at the same time that I was like finding a love for electronic computer-based music. So there's like a lot of that stuff hidden all over the place. There's tons of Disney things, just weird weirdness, a pug. I guess you've probably figured out I'm into pugs by this point in the interview, but uh, wearing an energy dome, um, what else? This is a big deal for me. Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys, hugely inspirational to the point where I got this beach wave machine because I'm dude, I'm like, dude, just the Beach Boys, I should have a sharper image sound soother that can replicate beach sounds. So yeah, pretty cool. Junk, though. I think this was like $20 on eBay. Surf, surf two, rain, waterfall. These are kind of funny. Uh, stomp box by Elon Paz. This is kind of cool, I got to feature um, my modded, well, this is a mistake. See, this is the trouble you get in when you, when you, uh, when you start appearing in books. That's the lamest thing to say. Uh, it's not an XB200 modulator. I'm just going on the record for saying that's the shell of it, but it's actually a modded space station. And I guess it kind of starts to say that in here, but it, I think it gets it kind of like incorrect. Oh yeah, there's like a big interview in this. Huh, well, in any case, there you go. That's kind of funny. There it is, that's the one right there. So, you know, at the time, like a space station, well, right now, a space station is very expensive. A real one, it's probably like 500 and up, but you can get these kind of cheapies uh, modded. This is the this is the XP200, the modulation system thing. That's like, you know, chorusing and flanging and stuff. And you, all you gotta do is like switch a chip in there and it turns it into a space station. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so yeah, rat pedal, like a distortion that's actually like shaped like a rat. Um, a ministry hat, a candy dish that's a Frankenstein, uh, a Homer Simpson while he's in hell. You know, these are the things that like inspire. Terramelos is 
my band. We started it, I think, in 2004. Oh my God, so we're almost coming up on 20 years. That's crazy. But uh, the punk band I was in before where I was talking about the twiddly guitar riff, it went, the guitar riff went, so it was like this techie thing. So imagine that that nonsense I just hummed out to a bunch of like punks drinking like beer. They're like, what? What are you doing, dude? So I go, okay, we got to start a new band. So me and the bass player, uh, started kind of like scheming on our own, like, okay, we should do this band. And we know this other weird guitar player from the hardcore scene, and he's kind of out and was like into different things. So maybe we could start hanging out with him and start making riffs together. So we started kind of like sitting on the couch, just playing, you know, guitar and, and writing stuff. And one of the earliest things we did was like this riff that went, bum, 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 you know, which was like, I guess in seven and then eight or something. That's like when we're like, oh yeah, we're kind of writing in like weird time signatures. So maybe that could be a thing that we do in this new band or whatever. So anyways, that idea becomes Terramelos and we put out a record in 2005 and kind of just start touring and doing the DIY thing and then end up on a record label, Sergeant House, put out a bunch of records and, you know, like the... The story of that band is like slow but steady. We've just like very, very like organically built a little bit of a fan base, you know? And the idea of the band was like, let's create a band where anything goes. Unlike the previous punk hardcore era, we're like, nah, you can't do that in this band. Like that doesn't work, you know? It's it doesn't make any sense. So we just wanted to do a band that we could do whatever we were wanting to do at that moment. So that was sort of like, the concept of that band. And, you know, it started off as like a proggy kind of math rock type thing. And then it like morphed into all these different things, taking all these influences, the electronic stuff, you know, the punk stuff coming back around. And, you know, it's been like a very fun, rewarding musical project to have going because again, like anything goes and figuring out ways to get these weird ideas out and put them into song format in a band like that is a very, like, rewarding thing. Our very first U.S. tour ever was with Portugal The Man in 2006, when they were still kind of like a psych rock band or whatever. So, yeah, I've known those guys, I guess, for a very long time now. And, you know, they blew up and had this crazy success and started, I don't even know, like, how they did that. Like, how the hell did that band get so big? But, yeah, like, you can't walk into a Starbucks without hearing that one fucking song. Actually, the other day, I was on hold with the vet, Dots vet, trying to make an appointment. And they're like, okay, vet, can you hold, please? I'm like, okay. And the song playing while I was on hold was that fucking Portugal The Man song. And I was like... Ugh, I don't ever want to hear this song again. Uh, <laughs> but it's a good song, you know. Uh, it's a testament to, I guess, it being a good song when you can't escape it. But anyways, um, yeah, so I played on their last couple records, and I've, I was in that band for a second, I guess you would say that. I was playing, you know, like, I toured with them. I played festivals. Actually, we've done, you know, quite a bit of recording that does never came out. Like there's like loads and loads of songs we've all worked on and like made together that maybe, you know, 40 years from now will come out on some crazy compilation. But yeah, good dudes. I wish them the best. I'm happy for their success and always stoked to be playing with them. Obviously I have like a lot of these pedals and I did not start off, you know, like hoarding. I started off with a couple things when I was 12 years old or something, you know, and was like, oh, pedals are cool. And uh, in fact, check this out. This is my very, very first pedal. This is what started it all. The DOD FX52 Classic Fuzz. Let's see, I would love for someone out there to restore this if possible. But yeah, this is my very first pedal. It's just, you know, a fuzzy distortion thing. I didn't, I didn't know the difference between fuzz or distortion or what that even meant when I was 11 years old, but I was like, oh, that's cool. It makes the guitar sound better, you know? So um, this is what started it all, and then it eventually kind of turns into this whole mess. I know it looks kind of psychotic, like, 
the organized, there's no organization here, right? This is like a rat's nest of insanity. And honestly, I even cleaned this up before you guys came over. This used to be like a big, like pile, just a mountain. And I just know, I know my mountain, you know what I mean? I know where everything goes. It could be overwhelming for someone to look at this and be like, dude, how do you, how would you know what to grab or what to do? And I just, I just know somehow. I think it's just like, you know, colorful things. And, you know, if I was like, okay, well, there's, uh, you know, there's some earthquake or stuff up here and this is clearly a boss row, but then I know there's like different little things around. So if I was like, Oh, where's my aqueduct? Fuck, it's not on my Earthquaker shelf. I'd be like, oh wait, I know what the aqueduct looked like. It's right here. You know what I mean? It's just sort of like, it's a visual thing. I don't know, I work that way with all this stuff. So this is all to say that this system actually works very well for me. Um, you know, like with all the colors and you know, weird funky paint jobs and everything I do to them. So I know this could be triggering to many people, but it works is what I'm trying to say here. So yeah, pedals, super into pedals. Um, I pulled some stuff out over here uh, just to talk about and demonstrate. This is actual junk. Uh, this is the Dan Electro Shift Daddy, which is a delay pedal. Uh, this I used in Terramelos on the, I guess, in a, I think I got this in around 2006, and uh, it's probably 20 bucks on Craigslist or something or whatever we were using in 2006 to find new stuff, pawn shop or something, and it's a, Delay pedal that does like, you know, funny shifting delay pitch, pitchy sounds, but obviously this is really busted. This is a brand new one that I found recently. It's supposed to look like a car. Shift daddy, it's like rockabilly style, you know? This ain't no wah. Make slow, gradual movements of the pedal. Shift daddy, so you know what I mean? That's like what it is supposed to look like. Anyways, I really, really like this series, and it's junk, you know? I also have this one from the same car series, the Danawa used $20. I don't have like cool, expensive stuff. Like, I don't have like a neat, you know, like electro harmonics thing from whatever year that's worth $2,000 or like a real con, you know. Sorry, I'm like, I'm like sidetracking here, but like I have a Klon clone. I don't have a real Klon. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I'm into like, we're on like show us your junk. So we're going like deep junk style. So anyways, back to the Dan Electro. Uh, this is part of the same series. This is like a fuzz wah, which is pretty funny. And actually um, funny story about this one. I sometimes will play Stooges music with Mike Watt. And when I was learning the set of music, I was like, fuck, I need a wah pedal, obviously, to play this music. And I don't really, I mean, I think there's some wahs hidden down there. Is this a wah? Source audio. No, that's an expression pedal. Is this a wah? No, that's an expression pedal. Is there a wah? Oh, is this a wah? Dual mode wish wash. Okay, so that's a wah. Uh, yeah, maybe my system doesn't work like I thought it does. Anyways, this was the one. This $20 stupid Dan Electro fuzz wah was like the most badass sounding, like, you know, so. Uh, Devi Ever um, Super Sodomizer. This was um, when my buddy Ben from Dwarfcraft, rad, rad um, pedal maker, he acquired Devi Ever and then asked me to do like a, a short run of custom pedals. Uh, and I did this with him. I did the art and kind of gave him the idea to do like a like a hyper version of the Sodomizer pedal. So that's what this is. If anyone out there wants to do a custom pedal with me, I'm like, I'm not trying to like be whatever, but I'm like, I'm down. I'm down to do like custom pedals. You want to do a signature pedal or something. Speaking of which, I kind of did that with this one going back to like, you know, obviously like colorful, fun looking pedals. This is the Keeley, uh, what do they call this? What is the name? That's so funny. We didn't even put the name of this pedal on here. That's fucking awesome. What is this thing called? Oh, it's the Synth One, here it is. <laughs> so I did like an artist version of this guy. You know, just going back to like colorful, fun things. I did the design on it. There's nothing sonically different. It's just like a limited edition, you know, funny looking thing. So it's the Synth One. Synth pedals, told you I'm a big synth guy. This thing's funny. 
check this guy out. It's an envelope filter. It's not good sounding. Like I really am not into the sound of the DOD envelope filter. It was just like very quacky. On the first Terramellis record, there's like a 29 minute noise jam at the end, the very last song. And like, for any like real heads out there that know what I'm talking about, there's like a quack sound that is happening throughout this noise jam. And it was the, not this one, but the original DOD envelope filter. So anyways, I probably like heard that on that recording. I'm like, fuck, I'm super not into that quackiness that's happening. So anyways, what I did with this envelope filter, this is the very first time that, the first and only time I was like, oh, it'd be cool to try and uh, modify a pedal or circuit bend one, which surprisingly, not, not a lot of stuff in this room is circuit bent, but this is one of them. And so what I did, have a look here. I cut up a piece of headphone wire. You know, I just took a piece of headphone uh, cabling and just cut it. And I just gradually started systematically touching the two ends from like point to point, like systematically like, oh, you know, one end would be on this thing, this piece of metal, and then I'd go through and just experiment to see like what was sounding cool or what was making something interesting. And I ended up landing on that point right there and this point right here. I don't know if you could see that, but anyways, it does something really, really cool. Um, and as you can see, I didn't solder. I don't know how to solder, so I just put a little piece of tape on it. So about 15 years ago, I just kind of taped that guy up with some headphone wire, but this makes a really, really, really cool sound. So instead of a quacky, a shitty quack sound, it actually does like 808 sub drops. So you pair that with the fuzz, let's say the super sodomizer fuzz, and you get some like really, really gnarly sick sounds. So those are those guys. Lastly, on my studio fun room of stuff, I got a lot of this sort of thing. Samplers, drum machines, funny things, even funnier things. I'm super into just like stuff that, <laughs> anything that has like, you know, an output that you could plug into a pedal or into a guitar amp or something, like this little row of thingies right here. You know, this is more of that type of stuff. SK-1, a funny like, you know, Behringer clone. Uh, Chaos pad, more guitar synths, an old microcorg. So just, you know, stuff that you can plug in. Actually, this is literal, I mean, I wouldn't call this junk, but I mean, this. I got this in the era of like being 16 and going to thrift stores. I did not buy this thinking Oh yeah, I'm like, I'm getting an SK-5 and it's the cool, like, you know, coveted sampler keyboard. I was just like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm getting it to do, you know, just funny dorking around in my bedroom. But, you know, come to find out many years later, this would become a sought after thing because you can sample, you know, sample into the little microphone and then we'll, uh, we'll plug this into a guitar amp and give you a, a little bit of a better demo on that. But. This is to say, I like electronic doodads. Oh, I mean, look at this, fuck. If ever there were like junk, I mean, this is, I got, I was visiting my parents at Christmas time and went into like a hospice thrift store and I was like, ooh, colorful, dumb looking and $12. I don't think this had batteries at the time. There was no batteries in it, but I was like, whatever. I'll just grab this thing and see if it works. And sure enough. Are you ready? Let's jam. So. What is that right there? What were we just talking about? Output, headphone output. So that means you could plug this thing into any one of these hundreds of pedals and do something really interesting and different with this. So anyways. <laughs> Junk, dude, like full on, there's nothing junkier than this thing.
I mean, that's like ready to sample. So here's what I would think. I'd be like, okay, let's plug this into some pedals. Maybe what I would do is sample, maybe sample that into one of these boxes, tweak out in there, get like a little bit of a drum loop going, get again, you know, some sort of synthesized. What else do we have in here? What is a breath? I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like, I'm just like, the, the thing, the gears are starting to spin in my head of what I could do with this $12 piece of junk. So, let's say bye. Let's jam again later. So this guy's trying to jam again later, which I will absolutely be doing. Are you ready? Let's jam. <laughs> Yo, 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 Line six DL4 looper. Started off as a love-hate relationship because if you know what this pedal is, you know the deal with it. They were not made very well. Uh, they broke off and you had to get switches replaced and have them modified. And this is probably about half of the ones I've gone through. The other ones just ended up giving away or in the trash or something. But this is truly an extension of my playing, being able to use these. Um, and they're rad, like, you know, it's, it's definitely like probably my desert island pedal. But you know, these ones back in the day, they were really tricky. So there's like a crazy, I don't know the timeline of like from the day we're filming this to whatever day you're watching this on. But by now, I'm guessing the new DL4 MK2 is out. This thing's insane. I mean, by now you've probably seen a lot of videos on it and I've probably been talking about it for a long time, but as we are at my house today hanging out, this is unannounced top secret shit that I'll probably get an email about being like, you weren't allowed to even say that in the video, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, relax, it's good. So anyways, DL4, this is the new one. It's a zillion times, uh, well, it's not a zillion times better. It's really like four times better because all they did was correct the things that were wrong with these. So better switches, a normal power source, uh, smaller, more, you know, sturdy, structurally sound, uh, and it has reverbs and new delays in it. So this thing's fucking sick. And one more thing. I do have over yonder a DL4 20th anniversary one out of 20 sparkle edition that I was given. And I have it on my shelf as like a trophy, like, you know, a little like, fucking that was badass, I got one of those. Uh, it's, uh, I think like The Edge got one, Dave Knudsen from Midas the Bear got one, maybe, I don't know, like some big dogs got one. I'm like, why did I get one? But I got one, so it's pretty cool. You know, I lived in a suburb outside Sacramento called Roseville. Very nerdy, safe, sheltered suburb. So any of like my show going or like, you know, culture came from going to shows in Sacramento. And at that time it was, you know, growing up, it was punk, fast, hardcore. You know, that was like what I was brought up on. And then around like 2000, 2001, okay. we all start hearing about this like, new band that has this drummer that plays like an alien. And by that point, I was into electronic music, say something like Aphex Twin or Square Pusher. And I can remember my friend saying like, oh yeah, there's this new band where the drummer can play like Square Pushery style drums, like really, really fast chaotic drums. And I remember being like, that's literally not possible. Like you can't physically move your body to do that. So it was kind of an eye roll. And we went to a coffee shop, 
to see this band that there was chatter about, and that band ended up being a band called Hella, which was a two-piece instrumental band, uh, guitar player Spencer Syme and drummer Zach Hill, and that was like, just completely shattered my brain. This is also around the time where I'm realizing like, I wanna play a little differently. I don't wanna just play power chords and like loud punk stuff. And so seeing these two freaks play this music to a bunch of punks that we were all like, what, what is going on right now? It was very like, you know, it, like mind expanding thing for us. So that was sort of like Sacramento from like, that I remember, let's say from 1996 up to like, you know, when the proggy weirdo explosion happens from like, oh, we're all into punk and like this thing. And then all of a sudden like, oh, now there's freaks in town, you know, like wh where'd these guys come from? And, you know, they showed all of us like suburb kids, like, oh my God, there's this whole untapped musical world that like, we can kind of figure out our own version of that. <laughs> So continuing the studio tour, uh, we have more synthy doodad, uh, drum machine type stuff. Um, you know, like I was saying, I just like collecting things. Uh, you know, I got, I don't, this was my buddy, this is Wands from Pedals and Effects. Uh, I don't even know what this is, but I just grabbed this from the studio at one point. Super section, programmable super section. I was like, that might be kind of interesting, you know. But just stuff, funny Yamaha DD5 drum pad, uh, you know, Omnicord, drum machines. This is the brain to just kind of backtrack for a second. Remember when I teased you about five minutes ago about like the crazy guitar that was owned by the Hanna-Barbera guy? This is the brain to it, which I'm not gonna plug in. You just, like I said, come over and hang out. I'll plug that thing in. Um, what else? Uh, some funky masks. This is the cover of a Terramellos record, uh, Trash Generator. That was the mask used for that. Obviously I'm into like weird shit. Uh, this is another mask from the same series that I use for an electronic project called Acid Fab. Obviously, like, I'm into, like, toys and funny things. Most of the stuff is all things that, like, has been gifted to me uh, on tour over the years. Or, like, you know, Tara Mellis Award from, this is the very first, like, shout out we got from the local newspaper in Sacramento. You know, or like, what else is something significant? That is from, it's a little guy from Belgium that I found. There's a peewee from somewhere. There's a funny pig's head. You know, I just like colorful again, going back to like, I don't know, this is just me. This is like my personality and I like to have all this kind of shit just um, out and about. Uh, this is kind of funny. This is something specifically that I wanted to show y'all. It's just like a happy face, right? That like just hangs on the wall, but it does something pretty cool. Lastly, what am I holding? I'm holding this uh, Radio Shack MG1 Concert Mate. This is a Moog synth in a Radio Shack shell, basically. And it's really fucking cool. Um, but there's a funny story with this, going back to junk. I was like 16 at a swap meet and I saw this, you know, like laying on a blanket, blazing in the sun. And I was like, what is this? This looks like something the rentals would use. I was really into the rentals at the time. I still am really into the rentals. And anyways, I'm like, it's got sliders and twisties and all this cool stuff, like that thing's neat. And it was fucking $40. So I like told the guy like, please hang on to this. I wanna get it, ran to my bank grabbed $40 out, which for a 16 year old in like, you know, 1997 or whatever, $40 is a lot of money. So I grabbed my 40 bucks and went and got this and I've had it ever since. So, 
Um, I saw Hella and Zach play many, many times starting around the year 2000. And I was so into it and enthralled by it and, you know, like felt my musical like DNA morphing every time I'd see, you know, him play. And I was, I never said one word to him. I wouldn't like, I wouldn't even like go up to him and be like, hey man, like good show. I really like your drumming. I was like, no, I don't want to like mess with this. I want to just observe it from, you know, afar kind of thing or, you know, three feet away from him <laughs> of where he's playing or whatever. But uh, so uh, it was around 2008 that a mutual friend, my buddy Dan Elkin was like, I think he had texted me or no, he may have called me. Is that a show? And he, he must have sent me a text. And it was like, hey, have you ever met Zach before? And I was like, no, dude, never. Like, I'm just, I'm good. I just like to watch him play, you know, and listen to his music. And he's like, I think I should introduce you to Zach. Like, I think you guys have really hit it off. And I know he's like, you know, wanting to expand who he's, you know, making music with. And I was like, oh, fuck. Whoa, okay. So he hooked us up. And then that was in 2008. And like, we met up. We nerded out hard. It turned out, you know, like we had a lot in common and, you know, we connected on a bunch of things. Like, obviously, because the last seven years, I had been such a mega fan of his that he was, you know, whatever shit that he was on was transferring to me. So, like, we had an automatic connection to it. Uh, and then ever since then, like, we've made a lot of records. In fact, like, I was doing the math recently. I can't remember what it was, but... I think possibly, like, I'm definitely in maybe, like, the top three people who, like, in terms of, like, how many records I've appeared on with him. I think I might be towards the top, which I'm like, fuck yeah, that's, that's sick. It's also weird talking about it like this because he's a really close friend of mine. He's one of my closest friends. So, but I still look at him as, like, a Jimi Hendrix figure to me. Like, ah, oh, dude, no... You don't understand. You changed shit for me and, like, a lot of people. And for anyone out there that's like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? It's just this crazy drummer. And without this drummer, like, there are things that would not exist. Actually, it's quite possible I would not be sitting here doing this interview with, you know, Earthquaker if I had not had that, like, shift in my head, because I might not have gone down this path of, like, techie weirdo music, which led me to pedals and sounds and all this stuff. So, um, anyways, yeah, over the years, you know, like, we've made records together. I've appeared on his solo records. He does a band called Death Grips. He's brought me in to do guitar on Death Grip stuff. So, yeah, I'm always, like, it's the most exciting thing for me when, you know we're texting about like, hey, we should do this or like, let's book studio time or even practice or anything. It's like, he's definitely like a very important part of my like musical ascension, I guess. Oh, hello. Welcome to my storage unit uh, where we're gonna talk about some guitar amps. So uh, if you'll um, look to my right, you'll see a stack of Roland Jazz Choruses. Here we have a Jazz Chorus JC77, we have a JC60, and then the classic 120. Um, inside my house, you'll find a couple of other hidden Jazz Choruses, and, you know, you might be asking yourself, like, why does he have so many? It's a solid state amp that they literally all sound identical. And I am asking myself that same question. Why do I have five of these guitar amps? I'm not really sure why. Uh, they're really cool. I just got into collecting them. Like over the last 10 years, they, you know, it's a good sound. The thing about the jazz chorus is for effects and synths and stuff, it's a very clear, true sound. It's not coloring, you know, the effect or the input at all, really. Uh, so for effects and that sort of thing, they're really, really good for. Um, they do slightly sound different. I mean, you know, it's a true chorusing effect where it's, you know, the, the, this, the signal 
uh, the chorusing signal is only happening to one speaker, I guess. I think I'm explaining that correctly. So, you know, the, the trick is to mic both speakers for like a real chorus. Like that's what Andy Summers would do, you know. Um, but this one actually does sound different than this one, if I'm being real, because this is a single speaker. So actually you're not getting the true stereo chorus. You're, it's only affecting the one speaker as opposed to, you know, like having this push and pull thing. So anyways, this one actually does sound different, but the joke about the jazz chorus is it's the world's biggest DI box, which I think is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so they are very like blank sounding. However, what I do with them is I pair them with this guitar amp here. And what is this? This is a PV6505 guitar amp, 212 100 watt combo. Except everything I just said is a lie. This is actually a Marshall JCM 800 head crammed into the body shell of a busted old PV6505. Uh, so the deal with this is the JCM 800 is like a grail amp uh, in terms of like rock music. This is the Ian MacKay sound, Tom Morello, like early Slayer, just that like mid-range crunch gnarliness. Uh, it's a really, really good amp from the early 80s. And this, what, this used to be a PV6505 that I used for many, many years. And I would pair this with the jazz chorus. So I'd run it stereo. So I'd have, you know, uh, coming out of a, like a DL4, you know, one, one uh, cable going into this, one going to this, and then I'd blend the signal and it was a really nice sound. After many years of just like abuse, the 6505 died on me. And so then I went and found like my gray lamp, like I was saying, the JCM 800. Now the deal with this was, was it came, um, it, uh, it was a 212 combo. And the box, the, the, the cabinet was like museum quality. Exhibit B came in this guy. And I mean, this is from like 1981. Look at this thing. I mean, it's almost like it never left the studio. You know what I mean? So my thing was like, I don't want to be the one to ruin this. I would rather just keep it nice, which obviously we've all seen what my gear looks like. I don't care about nice, but something that's from, you know, that was taken care of like this. I'm like, dude, I don't want to do it dirty like that and ruin it. So what I did was I took this to some amp dudes and I was like, hey, can we figure out a way to put the head, remove the chassis from the actual 212 cab and drop it into this PV6505 cab? And they were like, well, let us think on it. Any, anyways, obviously by now you figured out that it's upside down. Like, what the hell? Uh, that was the only way to get this in here was to, um, yeah, flip it upside down and jam it through the back. Whereas, you know, what a PV6505 usually looks like is this is not the controls. The controls are on top. So it would be like, here's all your knobs and everything. And then this is, you know, uh, this is a back plate usually with something like this, like a grill. At every show, a sound guy goes to mic it up, you know. He mics up the front. I'm like, oh, you notice anything funny about that amp? And they're like, no. You know, like a cranky sound guy, like, no, what do you mean? Looks fine to me. And I was like, check out the back. And then they they get to the backside and their mind is just blown because it's so hilarious and just like not right. <laughs> so anyways, this is uh, these are my live amps. Um, and then I have that Fender Mustang, <laughs> the Mustang GT, which actually, honestly, I've used that amp more than anything over probably the last two or three years because it's so convenient and sounds really good. And, you know, it's easy for bedroom recording, but... Um, I do like amps. Well, 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 what do we have here? A whole bunch of pedals and effects. This place probably looks very familiar to many people watching this right now, but if uh, you don't know what you're looking at, this is one already studio, Five Star Sound Labs, where we still do the pedals and effects thing. It's just been a crazy few years, so we've been chilling on it, but this is where it all happens. The magic, as they say, uh, you know, I feel like we tried to ballpark how many pedals are in this room at one point, and I don't know. Leave leave your guess in the comments. What do you think this is? Is this 
500 petals or is this, I don't know, like look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So a row is roughly 10 to 13. One, two, three, three rows back. So let's say up to 37 petals per row, let's say 40. One, two, three, four, five. I don't know, it starts to get exponential and fucking crazy, but this petals and effects, um, the way that this relates to my show us your junk episode is that before I moved down to LA, I had come down here, I was always down here visiting and doing music stuff, and I had met Juan, I think maybe in 2010-ish, at some Mars Volta stuff, and we kind of became buddies, you know, in the few years after that, and at some point, maybe around 2013, 2014, I came down here and Juan invited me to do uh, a Pedals and Effects interview where like I laid out my two pedal boards and went through everything and you know we talked about them and the sounds I made and at this point it's like janky shit it's like a broken Dan Electro tremolo I'm hitting Dan I'm like talking major trash on Dan Electro <laughs> on this show's your junk episode so no disrespect I love Dan Electro but like I had some trash on my board at the time and we did this interview and he was really stoked and I had a lot of fun and that was sort of like when we really hit it off hanging out for that day. And then like after that is when I found myself in the position of, I mean, I guess I would say like uh, gear companies acknowledging my existence which just hadn't really happened up to then even though I'd been touring for, you know, over 10 years and uh, doing stuff with sounds, you know, but that was like, I, I guess I got a lot of eyes on me from starting to hang out with Juan. And then he and I, like, he would have me come over again, you know, like, oh, you're going to be in town. You're visiting now. Like, come do another Pedals and Effects episode. So um, anyways, when I eventually moved down here around 2014, 15, we started doing this more consistently and then it became a thing we, we do together. So let's just say I'm demoing for Earthquaker or, you know, uh, I don't know, doing some sort of live thing at the NAM convention or whatever. All very foreign to me. Like, I'm just on the record. It's not something I feel that I'm... I don't know, I guess I'm good at doing it, but it just, it's not, like, I like playing guitar and making stuff, not necessarily being like, here's how you do this, or, you know. In, in other words, what I'm trying to say is it was like a very foreign world I found myself in of like being a gear demonstrator, but also trying to maintain my like artistic identity or whatever that means. So anyways, this was like the start of it. And actually, were it not for meeting Juan and doing you know, the pedals and effects stuff, like I literally would not be facing this camera right now talking to you about all my junk. So that's the story of me getting into this world. Well, when it comes to like, why do I, or why would anyone make music? It's like not a choice really. It's just something that, you know, you're like, well, that's what I do. It's just, it is what it is. Like I don't, I don't have an option not to create things with sound, AKA music. I think, you know, everything we've been talking about in terms of a guitar, you know, even just strumming a guitar on the couch that's not plugged in or a funny piece of shit, junky kid's toy or, you know, a really neat vintage synthesizer or something like, all of that is like what means the most to me as a human, you know, and making stuff out of those types of sounds. I get asked a lot about like, oh, what, how do you, what do you practice? Like, what is practice like for you? And it's funny because I, I can't think of the last time I actually sat down to, let's say, practice guitar or like work on my licks or a run or something. Like my version of practicing is plugging a bunch of things in and just like, diving deep into something and really like wanting to learn a machine or, a, you know, write a song or just like go super deep, you know, for let's say a week straight. Like every day I'm gonna wake up, go in my studio and just like grind on something. Um, and while I guess that is a form of practice, that's just like, that is just life to me. You know what I mean? It's like, oh yeah, there's just one of like the many layers of being a musician and artist. It's like, 
Yeah, that, that's just, again, like what brings me joy, you know, and I think figuring out what brings you the most joy when it comes to music, that is like probably the most important thing above anything else. Mm -hmm. 